I really hope that this class is, is helping you to um, kind of get a, um, a better grasp of the Bible. We've talked about, you know, just the Bible as a whole. We've kind of broken down some of the parts, like the promise and, and the law. And now I want to kind of push things forward and, and, and look more deeply at certain parts, or look deeper at certain parts uh, of the Bible. And in this lesson, we're going to look at the books of the law. Now, I highly encourage you to watch that that video about the law first because um, it's really going to, this is going to really build onto that. And uh, So, the books of the law are the first five books in your Bible. So that makes it Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, it's interesting, excuse me, that a lot of people see these books as so different because they are very much so one unit. They are one, um, one, uh, what am I trying to say here? Um, think of it as one book with five different parts of the book would be a good example um, because they are all very much so connected um, not just in the way that they progress historically but I mean the way that they're written um, they just really um, they really put things together like Genesis will show some things um, in it in its history portions that then Exodus and Leviticus or whatever will talk about in the law and and about how it is is not a good thing that this happened um, and I don't want to get too much into this, but when you're reading through Genesis and you get to Exodus, see Exodus as as part two of the same book. And Leviticus, then, when you get done with Exodus, as part three, and Numbers as part four, and Deuteronomy as part five. And see them as one unit together, because that's how they were written, to be understood together. Um, so as far as when did the events take place, and we'll look at this in, in, in each different book, but get this. Genesis picks up at the beginning of time, the beginning of created time, when God created things. Um, it doesn't say how long it transpired. It doesn't say really too much about anything. just kind of doesn't answer those scientific questions that some, some people have. It just blows right through it and, and highlights the important things. God created it, and it was good. It was without sin. Okay? Um, and then throughout the course of this, it takes us from the beginning of time all the way down to around 1400 or 1200, depending on when the Exodus happened and whatnot. Um, and if you don't know what the Exodus is, um, we'll worry about that when we get to the book of Exodus. Um, so it really just a, a very long time frame. You know, it just, it's a big chunk of time that just blows right through. As far as who wrote it, Moses wrote the actual books. However, Joshua kind of, it seems, uh, smooths stuff over. when, Because, like, for instance, at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses dies. Well, I don't think Moses wrote his own death. I, I don't think that happened. Um, so, obviously, there was someone else there, and Joshua was often around Moses. So, we can assume that Joshua helped Moses with it. Um, but then, also, we can tell that sometime later, a scribe came along and just kind of... Um, put all of it together um, and just kind of uh, added some final touches to it. For instance, when it talks about, um, I believe it's Ur, it says Ur of the Chaldeans in Genesis, but the Chaldeans didn't get there till a little bit later than the events actually happened. So, see what I mean? It was written later. Does that kind of make sense? And, and so it makes most sense that Moses wrote it, Joshua kind of helping out at certain parts, and the scribe later just kind of... Um, Finish drawing up. So um, that's just kind of the idea of the books of the law. Um, I hope I'm not missing anything important. If you have any questions, you know, put it in the comments below or anything. But as far as how do you understand it when you get to the books of the law, what do you do? Um, you know, you, you've gotten there and you're like, okay, I'm reading this and it just doesn't make sense. And there's a few things to keep in mind. So when reading, pay attention to these two points. First, the law is connected with Israelite history. And second, read it in light of the New Testament. So first off, it is for Israelite, the Israelites. 
It is not for every Christian for all time. However, the principles in, uh, in it still do apply to today. Okay, The law was given to Israel Israelites before Jesus came. Okay, We don't have to follow the sacrifices anymore. We don't have, have priests anymore. We don't see what I mean? That's not for us today in that aspect. But let me kind of clarify. It is for us in another way that it is part of the Bible and all the Bible is inspired by God. And even though we are not under that covenant, of under the law, it still does apply to us through principles. Okay, and I'll kind of show what I'm meaning, just saying. And then saying off, read it in light of the New Testament. So don't just read it, ask, does the New Testament say anything about this? And I'll, and I'll show you what I mean in an example. But first, I want to um, quote from this book, Grasping God's Word. It's by Scott Duvall and Daniel Hayes. Um, and they say uh, four things that, that are extremely important. I'm sorry, five things that are extremely important. First off, the covenant is closely associated with Israel's conquest and occupation of the land. The, the law is tied in with Israel going to Canaan and, and making it their land. Okay. Second, the blessings in the law are conditional they are not meant to be um sorry um i lost my train of thought there they are conditional it's not for sure that they would get those things they had to they had to obey god in order to get the blessings uh, third off the the law is no longer functional what that means is it's no longer um it's no longer a thing for people um Basically, what that means is Christians don't have to follow it anymore. And I know sometimes Christians try to take pieces of the law and make people follow it, but we're not under the law anymore. We're under grace. And if you're confused about this, just read through the New Testament and it'll kind of explain it, especially Galatians and Romans. Um, so then the fourth, fourth point that I want to say from them um, is that the law as a part of the covenant – doesn't apply, and that, that kind of apply to us um, as law. And that's kind of what I just said, um, so I'm not really going to elaborate too much because I, I kind of already said that. Um, and then lastly, their, their last point goes with my second point there. Um, we have to interpret the law through the New Testament. When you're reading the Old Testament, you, you, you take it, and you read something, and you see, okay, now what does the New Testament have to say about this? How does it, how does it, um, how does it answer this? And I'll walk you through a very quick example. In Leviticus chapter 5, verse 2, Leviticus chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Or if anyone touches an unclean thing, whether a carcass of an unclean wild animal, or a carcass of unclean livestock, or a carcass of unclean swarming things, and it is hidden from him, and he has become unclean, and he realizes his guilt. See, he he didn't know that he'd done anything wrong. He's still guilty. And then here in 5, six, five through 6, When he realizes his guilt in any of these, and confesses the sin he has committed, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin that he has committed a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat, or a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin. So, um, let's kind of break this down. First off, it says, if anyone touches anything, anything unclean. In the Old Testament, if you touch something unclean, you were unclean, right? Well, in the New Testament, Jesus said that it's not what you touch that makes you unclean, it's what is inside of you that makes you unclean. Does that make sense? Um, it, it's what proceeds out of your mouth that makes you unclean. So in other words, this is the problem of uncleanness, is what's inside of you, not what you do on the outside. Okay, so um, then, so that's the first biggest area of, of change. Second off, God doesn't live in a, or it's not that he did before, but God doesn't meet with us at a tabernacle. He, he lives inside of us. So this is both, more scary and less scary. First off, it's more scary in the fact that the Almighty God has chosen us as his vessel rather than making us have a certain place anymore. So that brings with it a lot of change then. Um, however, with that being said, 
Um, so God is mighty, and, and we can't sin against him, obviously, because that still is, is bad. Okay, But um, we don't have to necessarily do these things to keep God in the midst of our tent anymore. Does that make sense? So it's not about these outward things anymore. It's about the inward thing. So I kind of I kind of hope that that makes sense. Maybe I'm kind of making it more confusing. So I'll just skip to the next point. Um, in the second half, regardless of whether they did it intentionally or unintentionally, it was still sin. It was still wrong. Um, I don't want to say sin, but it was still wrong. Um, and the same, that say, that still applies to us today. We sometimes do things that we didn't even realize that we had that we had. Um, that it was wrong, especially especially new believers. You know, um, you get saved and you're just gung ho, but you don't really know the basics of, of Christianity. Um, and it says when you do realize that, that you've done that you've done something wrong, to then confess and uh, have the priest or you know, offer a sacrifice that the priest will will do. Well, so there's a few things. First off, we still confess our sins. We still do that, but. Um, we don't have to go to a priest anymore, and we don't have to sacrifice anymore. Um, rather, Jesus has already done those things because he is the priest and the sacrifice. So all we have to do is confess our sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Um, so I hope that that kind of explains um, so how that would apply to us today. Um, I'm going to use the example that um, was that they used in this book, and that's... Um, Okay, so porno watching pornography. This is this is a bad thing, and it's from your in. So that kind of makes sense. It's not something that you touch that you're touching from the outside. It's something that's in you that's wrong. Does that make sense? So you do this thing, and you realize it was wrong for me to to to, um, to lust after women. See that lust is, is what's making you unclean. It's it's on the inside, and so you go to the Lord and you say, Lord, I messed up in this, and you ask for forgiveness, right? So that, that's how that would apply to us today. I hope that that kind of makes sense. Um, once again, if there's any questions, you can put it in, in, the, in, the, in the comments below, and I'll, and I'll try to answer it. Maybe I wasn't clear enough. Um, it's better on parts like this to have it in, as an actual um, class where people are talking because you can really know whether you're saying something clear or not. So that takes us to the first of the books of the law, which is Genesis. Um, and Genesis ha has 50 chapters, but the first 11 are very unlike the last uh, 39, okay? It deals with all people, and it deals with prehistory. These are events that we can't really compare with other events, not so much, because they were before recorded history, before people were writing this stuff was going on. So with that, we have Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. We have them sin, and they get kicked out. We have, um, but they're spared. Remember that. God spared them even though it called for death. Okay, remember that. Um, <clears throat> and then you have, you know, the people spreading throughout the world. You have a flood, and you have... Um, uh, the Tower of Babel, all these different things that happen with, with kind of people as a whole. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, but then, starting in chapter 12, things kind of change all of a sudden. Rather than talking about people in general, it narrows down to one family. A guy by the name of Abraham. Well, it's Abram, but then God changes it to Abraham. Um, and it goes through him... You know, he goes to Egypt a couple times, and he has a kid, um, uh, Ishmael. Uh, but this isn't the, the the child that God has promised him. So uh, later he has um, a second son, Isaac. Then Isaac has uh, Jacob. And then Jacob has, um, his name is changed to Israel. And he has what's what later becomes known as the 12 tribes of Israel, his 12 children. Um and uh, this ends, this uh, Genesis ends with them going into um, Egypt to live uh, because of a famine. Um, so let's kind of stop right there real quick and talk about the, the 12 sons. He, Jacob has 12 sons through four wives, two wives, and then two um, servants of those wives who the, he also marries. Um, and from those 12 sons, he gets 12 tribes. 
Um, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, uh, Joseph, and Benjamin. But here's where things get a little bit complicated. Um, Joseph has two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who are adopted in and become part of the twelve. So that leaves us with 13 tribes, unless you count Joseph's, Joseph as well, which is 14, but they don't. Um, Joseph is taken off, and Ephraim and Manasseh are added, but that still leaves us with 13 tribes. That's because Levi is not counted. Levi is not counted because he was, um, from Levi came the priests. Um, and the priests were not able to inherit things. Rather, they had um, they had it where um, the rest of the tribes provided for them, and they did the work of the tabernacle. Of the tabernacle. Okay, so uh, Joseph becomes Ephraim and Manasseh, and Levi is not counted, which leads us back to twelve. Um, yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> And as far as um, Judah, you may notice that Judah is the tribe that Jesus comes from and not Reuben. This is because Reuben sleeps with his father's um, either concubine or wife. Um, I think wife. I believe wife. Um, and so he's taken off. Then Simeon and Levi both go and slaughter a, uh, a, whole, a whole village. Um, and so they're taken off, and so that leaves us with Judah. The third, the third born becomes inherits the firstborn blessing by having Jesus come through him. Um, now, as far as why Levi was still counted as was still used for the as priests, um, when that happened, I'm not quite sure. But we learn something new every day. So. Uh, Genesis covers about you know the beginning of time to right around 1700, um, and just kind of stops there. It, the Israelites are in the land of Egypt. Things are well for them, but um, they're not really where they're supposed to be. Um, you know, obviously God intended for them to. to he's going to bring them back to um, Canaan, which will then be Israel. Um, so that takes us to uh, Exodus. Um, and you'll have to excuse me, I forgot to put the thing where it pops up one at a time. So it skips 400 years of slavery, because after after the end of Genesis, um, the Israelites are enslaved to Egypt. And it skips pretty much all that, just barely picks up on the tail end of it. And that gets us somewhere around the 1400s or 1200s, depending on when Israel left Egypt. This is called the Exodus. Okay. Um, so uh, in that... Uh, Moses is uh, called by God to lead the people out of, out of Egypt, to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And um, he asked God this. He says, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. And that's where we get. Um, you may have heard the heard the heard Yahweh or Jehovah. That's where we get Yahweh from. However, we don't. Er, Hebrew didn't have vowels originally, so we don't know exactly how it was pronounced. And so that leaves us with Y H W H as it comes down into English. Um, so uh, what does his name mean? It, 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 it means he is self-sufficient. It means that he's faithful. It means that he is uh, always. That he always exists. Um, which is, is a very powerful thing um, when you think about it. And obviously, uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm just kind of touching the tip of the iceberg about what scholars have, have said about it, so I'll just kind of leave off there. Um, but also, it's important to note this. Before the law was given, Israel was still held to the covenant. Look at this in chapter 4, verse 23. Um, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn. Then right here in verse 4, 24. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah, who is Moses' wife, um, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a, bride, a, bride of, uh, a bridegroom of blood to me. Um, so he let him alone. It was then that, he, that she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. See, Moses was called by God to do this thing, but he still wasn't... Um, he still wasn't following. He wasn't following God's covenant, who he, which he gave to Abraham, way back in Genesis. 
Um, so we see that, that Moses was still held accountable to following that covenant until the law was given. People ask this, why, why is Israel... Okay, why is Israel not saved now when they're following the law that God gave them? Because at that time, God God told them to follow the law. But then when Jesus came, he fulfilled that law. He brought it to its conclusion. He He, he made it what it was meant to be. He finished it. We, we are not part of that Old Testament law anymore. Does that make sense? So, by following the... By following, uh, uh, Jewish religion now, you are actually sinning against God. See, because Jesus has come and fulfilled that. This is once again why I say, please, please, please do not do things like celebrate Passover and whatnot, because Jesus is our Passover lamb. If You cannot return back to the vomit. That's what dogs do. We're talking about moving forward. And Jesus has fulfilled the law. The law is set aside. Does that make sense? So, does, there are still principles that apply to us. We already talked about this. It still does apply to us, but it doesn't have rule over us. The law does the law doesn't apply. However, there are principles in the law that do apply. I hope that explains. It's like this: all the Bible applies in the sense that 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 um, it's for us today. Today, okay. However, that doesn't mean that with the with the law that you have to. I'm I'm having a hard time think, thinking of a way to say this. With the law that you still have to follow the law. So, anyways, if you're if you're confused, leave a leave a comment below. I explained this in the last video, so I don't know why I'm confusing you so badly now. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay, so Exodus has has Israel um, freed from the land of Egypt. They cross the they cross the ri they cross the river, and they get to or the sea, whatever, and they get down to uh, a place called Mount Sinai where God gives the law through Moses to the people. And this, the law is given through the last end of Exodus, through Leviticus, and through the first half of November. I'm sorry, of Numbers. <laughs> I said Novembers. Of Numbers. And Exodus really in theme kind of answers the question of where to worship. Okay, it talks about, it talks about the tabernacle. But then... Oh well, let me talk about this first. So here, are the, here's Egypt. Here, here's the Nile Delta. Here's the Nile there, and so here's the land of Goshen up here. They left from there, went down here, crossed the sea here, the Red Sea, and they go down here. And this is Canaan right here, by the way. And they don't go this way. They don't even go this way. They go down this way to Mount Sinai, where God keeps them there um, for a while before leading them up. Excuse me. Up, 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 up to the land of uh, Canaan, which would then be later be called Israel. However, um, as we'll talk about in Numbers, the Israelites mess up, and they just don't they don't follow God. They don't trust Him. They don't listen to what He says. So they come back out here to the wilderness, and they kind of live out here for 40 years, doing pretty much nothing. And then um, in Joshua, they finally go over into into Israel. So. Um, that brings us to the book of Leviticus. Why is it called Leviticus? Because of the tribe of Levi, who was the, the um, who were the who was the tribe that, that served as priests. So Levites, Leviticus. Um, it's immediately following the events of Exodus. They're still at the at Mount Sinai, so somewhere around the 1400s, 1200s area, somewhere in there, around there. Um, did I miss anything on that Exodus thing? Um, no, I did not. And so Leviticus then describes how to worship. Now remember, this was for Israel then, not for Christians now. Okay, well, yes, all the Bible does still apply to us. However, there's uh, things have been fulfilled now. And I'm once again getting back onto this because I'm, I'm really hating the way I worded it, but eh, we move on, huh? Um, so also uh, a big difference that we see here is that God dwelt in their midst, not in them. Okay, there's a big difference there. Um, and uh, the, the law was not written on their hearts, as it is for us Christians now. It was instead given to them. Okay, so. Um, that takes us to the book of Numbers. I mean, in Leviticus, all that really happens in Leviticus is, is, the, is more of the law is given. Um, as far as events, not a whole lot happens in Leviticus. Um, numbers, 
um, is, it immediately follows Leviticus. So all these books are back to back. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Same, uh, whereas there was a gap between Genesis and Exodus, and there's a gap between no Numbers and Deuteronomy, there is no gap between Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Okay, and immediately follows Leviticus. But then about halfway through, there's a there um, is Israel is is going into the land of Canaan, and they don't listen to God after continually continuously rebelling against Him in the in the wilderness. And so finally, um, as punishment, they can't go into the land of Canaan. So God sends them back out for 40 years in the wilderness. But they can't even do this when God tells them, okay, you can't go into the, land, into the promised land now. Then they rebel and say, okay, we are going to the promised land. And um, this obviously falls apart since God was with Moses. Um, and so they spend 40 years in the wilderness. Um, but it's still somewhere around the 1400s, 1200s time frame somewhere. It's hard to be precise since we don't know the exact pharaoh and all that stuff. Um, but what we do see is that faith causes obedience. Some people read no books like Numbers and they say, See, if you so much as mess up, God's going to hound you down. No, 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 no. What happened was the Israelites had a rebellious heart. They, were, they continuously were rebelling against God because they were not trusting in God. And so as a result, their actions were evil because their heart was not surrendered to God. And so they kept doing bad things because of the bad that was in their heart. So as a result, whenever the time of testings came, they, they failed those testings because they wouldn't surrender to God. They tried to do things their own way. They tried to put, make God conform to what they wanted from him. And so they lost out on the blessings. God is faithful and he's loving. When we mess up, he's not waiting to... to to, to punish us, but what he's looking for is a heart that is surrendered to him. And Israel would not surrender their heart. They wouldn't surrender their heart. They just kept rebelling against God. And so as a result, there were well, there were there was an effect for that. Um, however, Numbers um, is, is really a strong contrast. It talks about the blessings and everything, but then we see a bunch of curses given to Israel. Why? Because they didn't obey. So, um, you know, we have, oh, well, they had, there were this many Israelites and everything, and everything's all going great, but then they sin, and what happens? God wipes out some of their numbers. See I mean? Blessings and curses according to obedience. Um, <clears throat> sorry, this shirt is bothering me. Um, so as far as how many, I know some people think that, that the... Um, that the numbers are very precise, that's just not very accurate. See, the thing is, Hebrew is not as cut and paste as we'd like. You know, it's not as, as it's not like it's an exact transfer over. And so there's a lot of ideas and concepts in Hebrews that in Hebrew that is very difficult to get in English. Um, and as a result, some things are, are, are mistranslated and not quite understood. Um, I talked about this with the son of. A son of in Hebrew can, can be separated by many generations rather than a direct descendant. Um, for instance, my son could be my, called my father's son because he's still of his eventual descent. So I mean, that's how Hebrew works. Um, with the numbers, it, it's, it's, it's very hard to know um, whether those numbers were taken to be literal, to be, um, or, or to be um, um, groups and not people, like in which case there would have been significantly less people. I can't really get into that mu that much, but if there really were over six hundred thousand men alone, over two million people, okay, there would have been way too many for the land. The people would still be going into the land of Canaan when some people were still on the Red Sea. Um, also, they could have overtaken the armies of Egypt and Canaan because Egypt only had about twenty thousand people in their armies. So that doesn't make any sense. The land wouldn't have been able to to to, to um to um, to provide for them because their cattle would have been enough to, uh, enough to drive the land to despair, let alone them too. The, the amount of water that would have had to have been provided is astronomical. Um, it, it's just very unlikely. Um, yeah, and also they really wouldn't have had much to be afraid of uh, in the land of uh, Canaan when they went there because they would have far outnumbered them. So. Um, that's a that's just a little uh, an artist rend uh, uh, what is it called rendering of what it looked like um, for.
for the in the camp of Israel. You can see how there's um, tents on each side. There were three tribes on each side. Three, six, nine, twelve, um, and the tabernacle was in the middle. Um, so that takes us to the book of Deuteronomy, and this is the last thing we'll talk about. Um, Deuteronomy takes place right outside of Canaan. They, they spent their 40 years in the wilderness, and now they're waiting to go across. Um, and, the, and the book of Deuteronomy is given. So that's right around, for, once again, 1400s, 1200s, somewhere in that, in that window. All the books happen pretty close together, so it, we're really not making that much historical progress. Um, Deuteronomy means second law, and this doesn't mean that, the, that, that um, Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers are at odds with this one. It just means that the law was reestablished with the next generation before they went across into Israel. Um, and it was meant to be read every seven years. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and throughout all this, people always ask, what about holy war? You know, because Israel was commanded to go forth and conquer. Um, first off, there's a few things. The people who... Um, who this who they were told to go and conquer were extremely wicked they would sacrifice their their kids they worshiped other gods they did it repeatedly god tried god gave them plenty of time for repentance and they had a rebellious heart if you notice who they came from descendants wise from noah's um from from noah's sons that's also a factor in my opinion um and it is once again important to realize that god gave them plenty of time to repent they never did okay um and in fact, God says in one, pl one part, part, their iniquity is not yet finished. I'm give, so giving them some time, um, and they they wouldn't they wouldn't repent for for all their for all their misdeeds. And so as a result, um, well, God brought punishment. Um, remember that God's wrath is poured out on anyone who who Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus saves us from God's wrath, and God's wrath is poured out on sin. He hates sin. That makes sense. And when you choose sin over God, you are siding with sin. So God is a just God, isn't he? He's a loving God, right? Well, doesn't that demand action? Is it fair that the righteous suffer from the wicked because God doesn't take care of the wicked? See what I mean? God is patient. He's loving. He's just. So God's justice demands action. If God is supposedly just, but he doesn't do anything about it, how is that justice? Would you say a judge is just if he doesn't prosecute the person who killed a child or prosecute the person who raped a girl or see what I mean that's not justice so God's justice demands action and remember he waited a long time and they were continuously doing extremely wicked things um, so then but holy war has rarely ever been commanded though okay and that was only at the time of Israel the Israelites were commanded to attack certain people in the land of Canaan okay that's it Okay, not that Israel now is justified in any holy war that they decided to partake, not that anyone is ever justified in a holy war, like the Crusades, for instance. Um, this was a one-time event. Understand history in the context. So, um, oh, whoops. There we go. Um, so I hope that there's no, no questions. I hope that I explained everything. But if I didn't, please leave, please leave a comment below, and I will get to it um, as soon as I can. And hopefully as clear as I can too. So.